Hello and thanks for staying tuned to the show that goes around the continent to bring you stories near and far. I am Vukola Koka at Channels Television here in Lagos and I'm joined by Vincent Makori from Voice of America in Washington, D.C. Well, thanks. I'm Vincent McCory at The Voice of America. Happy to be with you again for another edition of Africa 54. Let's start off with the latest from Nigeria. Channels Television brings you that story. Mental health experts are calling for the urgent implementation of the Mental Health Act in Nigeria in order to reverse the dangers posed by the rising statistics of mental health cases in the country. The experts spoke at the 2023 Mental Health Conference in Abuja against the backdrop of the latest report by the World Health Organization, which states that an estimated 40 million people suffer from various forms of mental health disorder in the country. It is a round table put together by the Federal Ministry of Health in Abuja to discuss the implementation of the Mental Health Act, which was passed in 2021. How many different deliberations? The event attracts mental health experts, health development partners and heads of missions and agencies in Nigeria. This conference is coming on the heels of the WHO 2023 Mental Health Report, which reveals that 20% of Nigeria's population, representing about 40 million people, suffer from various forms of mental health disorder. The report further highlights that only about 10% of the population have access to professional care. Some of the participants at this conference believe strongly that there is an urgent need to break the barriers to treatment and scale up training of the mental health workforce in the country. We believe that together we can dismantle the barriers that hinder access to mental health services and together we can promote an environment where seeking mental health support is encouraged and embrace without stigma. The recent findings from the WHO strike a chord of urgency within us, as only one in 10 individuals in Nigeria seeking care actually receives the necessary treatment. This stark treatment gap highlights the need that has brought us all here today to emphasize mental health as a paramount concern the Mental Health Act protects people with mental health illnesses from all forms of abuse, violence and torture. The Act also advocates for their rights to access social services such as health care, education, employment and housing. Both the Minister of Health, who is represented by the Director of Public Health, and the Mental Health Officer at the International Organization for Migration underscore the urgent need for the implementation of the Mental Health Act. We want to actively and deliberately implement the Head Act of 2014. And I think this is an opportunity that we must not allow to slip by. Implementing my, uh, National Mental Health Act, the National Suicide Prevention Strategic Framework, and the National Mental Health Policy will contribute to the pro prevention, protection, and access to services that would improve health and well-being of the general population and the agenda for sustainable development call for the universal mental health and psychosocial support that leaves no one behind, including migrants and refugees. Mental health disorder is a leading cause of suicide, which is a development that experts say is made worse by stigmatization, another major problem that the Mental Health Act also seeks to address. Joining us for further discussion on this important subject on mental health disorder in Nigeria is consultant psychiatrist, Lagos University Teaching Hospital, Dr. Temila Deadegwite. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you. Now let's start with what seems to be most important. Why the delay in implementing the Mental Health Act since its passage in 2021? What are the bottlenecks? Yeah, yeah. I agree with you. The Mental Health was, I mean, Act was passed as a bill in 2021. And in January 2023, 
It was signed into law by President Muhammad Buhari. So it became, the, it became a law almost immediately. So saying that it has not been imp implemented may not be technically correct. However, it has not been fully implemented by most mental health facilities. And that may be because there are certain issues with the mental health act that was passed into law. For example, certain aspects of the bill has issues. Let's take, for example, the aspect that has to do with um, admission of individuals with mental health condition. I mean, the law says that before you can admit, a psychiatrist would first of all review, make ease or assessment, and then offer admission. And again, we need a second opinion. We need another psychiatrist from, for example, another facility that has nothing to do with the hospital, you know, to also review and make assessment before the individual can be admitted. After that, the initial admission will be for, I think, a period of about seven days. After that, then they can now, you know, request for a document to be sent to Mental Health Commission for full admission of such individual. Unfortunately, we do not have the Mental Health Commission available. What are the prospects for partnership between Nigeria and perhaps other countries in the West, you know, to tackle this mental health problem uh, through personnel, particularly because of the brain drain? Well, when we talk about partners, we would say that partnership with, for example, the World Health Organization, we have other uh, non-governmental organizations, we have the um, other national stopping, I mean, suicide prevention initiatives, but they are so few. They are so, 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 so few. What do we do? We continue to psychoeducate educate the people. We will continue to, you know, increase awareness because when we are talking about prevention, awareness and psychoeducation is key and we continue to do that. We would say that we have gone a bit far, but we still have a long way to do. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Temilade Adegwite, consultant psychiatrist, Lagos University Teaching Hospital. Thank you so much for your time on the program. Thank you. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54 and check out our headlines 24-7 on viewafrica.com. After the break, shelters for survivors of human trafficking. Kenyan authorities help victims recover from trauma and rebuild their lives. Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. The Kenyan government is setting up shelters for survivors of human trafficking. Authorities say the goal is to help victims recover from their traumatic experiences, rebuild their lives, and prosecute human traffickers. For VOA, Victoria Amunga reports from Nairobi. Masinjeru says her two attempts to find work in the Middle East in 2014 and 2020 turned horrific. Both times she was promised work in an office and instead ended up as a domestic worker in private homes where Njeru says she was beaten and overworked. If I did not finish some work, they would beat me. Or, for example, when the baby would cry and bother them, and I did not hear the baby cry because I was cleaning somewhere else, he and his brothers would come and beat me up. Njeru managed to get out with the help of an aid group called Heart Kenya, but officials say she's an exception. Many victims of human trafficking remain trapped. Now the Kenyan government is setting up shelters for victims of human trafficking. Authorities say many survivors do not have a place to live, making it difficult to help them and investigate their traffickers. We require to keep them in a safe place as investigations are ongoing and also to enable them to reintegrate back to the society. So we have specialists in all sectors to assist them 
build up their confidence so that they are able to fit into the society. The government says many Kenyans are lured with the promise of jobs online and sent primarily to the Middle East and Far East countries such as Laos, Malaysia and Thailand. The UN Refugee Agency says protection of victims of human trafficking are severely lacking, especially in Africa. Some are left to suffer repeated and multiple forms of abuse and even die. Non-profits such as Heart Kenya are working to help. We provide the support either by helping them to come back to the country or helping them if they need support in terms of getting uh, different forms of direct assistance, such as legal aid, uh, uh, therapy, medical intervention, or we support them to restart the, 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 the plans. Like Njeru's plan for her future, she's studying to be a hairdresser now. Aid groups and government officials say they hope by working together, more victims of human trafficking can be saved and more traffickers prosecuted. Victoria Amunga for VOA News, Nairobi. The African Union Third Men's Conference on Positive Masculinity has ended in Pretoria, South Africa, with the theme Accelerating Commitment Towards the African Union Convention Ending Violence Against Women and Girls. In attendance include South Africa's former president, Mfuzile Lambo Unguka, former president of Liberia, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, and many other dignitaries. The event aims to reshape conversations and action towards a safer and more inclusive society. Our South Africa correspondent, Innocent Samosa, has more. Dignitaries from across the African continent are engaging in conversations that aims to shape societal norms and promote positive behaviors. This meeting is the third of a meeting called Positive Masculinity that aims to get a convention passed by the leadership of the African Union. Discussions are underway to accelerate commitments towards the African Union conversation, especially focusing on ending violence against women and girls. We are hoping be, that at the end of this conference there will be commitments from men individually and collectively not to be involved in violence against women and girls. Generally societies, communities, there is a growing realization including in international organizations, multilateral like you have with the African Union, that the battle against gender-based violence. Of course we live in patriarchal system when men dominate, right? But what we need is to make sure that the men uh, change, we go into changing, you know, the culture, the mindset, the societal approach. Participants at uh, the Men's Conference on Positive Masculinity says it's time to change the status quo. The message I have towards every single man out there is that there is no excuse for abuse. In fact, there is no excuse for any form of abuse from any human being, right? But uh, because the highest perpetrators of GBV are men, we have to focus on that. Well, firstly is to call each other out. And uh, I know it's very difficult to unlearn some certain things. So we are here to listen to the international message. It is not just an advice in general, regionally, provincially, or a South Africa, but international message. So with my experience, I always say it's better to be a has-been than a never-been. Some of us, we've been there, done that. However, we are not proud of the things that we have done in the past, but we are doing things better. Meanwhile, conversations towards a safer and more inclusive society continues. From Pretoria, South Africa, Innocent Samosa, Channel Television News. Malawi has faced chronic food insecurity for years, but a 110% increase in maize prices from the previous year have made this situation worse. Chimwemwe Padatha has this report from the capital, Lilongwe. Malawi is facing natural and man-made challenges that are causing food insecurity. In February, the country was hit by Cyclone Freddy which washed away thousands of hectares of crops in the south. 
The price of maize a staple crop has risen 110% compared to the previous year, according to an August report by the Famine Early Warning Systems Network that has left many families scrambling to pay for essential food items, says Davison Kugu, a maize trader. Things are not good this year. Prices of maize have gone up and it is hard for most people to purchase. A 50 kilogram bag of maize is now selling at 43 US dollars, which is an equivalent of 47,000 kwacha. This is too high for families to afford. A recent maize market report by the International Food Policy Research Institute, or IFRI, shows that prices of maize in Malawi are among the highest in Africa's southern countries. Jan Dushoslav, an IFRI research fellow based in Malawi, said the situation is partially caused by challenges to the implementation of the Affordable Inputs Program, a government program that allows farmers to purchase farm inputs at a subsidized cost. Well, the official production estimates show that there should be just about enough maize in the country. Chances are that uh, given how, how high prices are going that there is less uh, high prices and uh, the scarcity of fuel probably did not help much either recently. It's, it's expensive to move, uh, to move food around. Uh, there's big uncertainty about what will uh, uh, what will happen with the uh, input subsidy program going into the next in, in, into the next harvest uh, next growing season? Konwanihara of the Center for Social Concern, a social justice advocacy institution, blames the high maize prices on a lack of food security policies. This bill was drafted by Department of Nutrition in collaboration with civil society organizations way back, but up to now the bill hasn't been. Um, uh, project to Parliament to deliver it. World Food Program country representative Paul Tenbu says that Russia's invasion of Ukraine has contributed to the current food insecurity. The war between Russia and Ukraine has, has hit global food security and Malawi has not been spared. Uh, we remember that the fertilizer prices are already going up uh, sharply in, in 2021, but in 2022 they doubled. Um, with, with the onset of the war. A large amount of the fertilizer that is traded globally comes from uh, Russia and Ukraine. An estimated 4.4 million Malawians are likely to face hunger in the 2023-2024 consumption period, making up 22% of the country's population. According to the August 2023 Malawi Vulnerability Assessment Committee report published by the government. Despite this, the government says it has yet to fill up the grain reserves to ease access to the step of grain for those in dire need of food assistance. Chimwe Barata, VOA News, Lilongwe, Malawi. The spotlight on the Al Kabulan Immigrants Awards, where resilience and positive impact were celebrated. The event highlighted the outstanding contributions of immigrant refugees in South Africa acknowledging their remarkable efforts. Additionally, it honored individuals who have triumphed over adversity, enriching the tapestry of their adopted homeland. Our South Africa correspondent, Innocent Samosa, was there and captured the spirit and stories of these inspiring individuals. Take a look. The Al Kebulan Immigrants Awards celebrate the diversity and resilience of those who have faced unimaginable challenges and against all odds have thrived. The Al Kebulan Immigrants Impact Awards stand as a testament to the power of unity in diversity. The remarkable contributions of immigrants and they are invaluable uh, contribution in shaping our society. The Zulu Indian dancers got everyone on their feet, moving to the rhythm. <laughs> 
I had the privilege of speaking with some of the award recipients and their stories are nothing short of inspiration from entrepreneurs creating job opportunities to activists championing human rights. Absolutely, it's such an honor to be this award, especially the first years of this award and being part of the human hum humanity um, activities that we've been doing for the last three years. We are very young organizations, but we actually meet impacted almost 100,000 people in South Africa. The world is seeing what you are doing. It's just a word of encouragement for you to go forward and then to continue the journey that you have started like years ago. Ambassador Andre Nzapayeke emphasized Nigeria's significant role in supporting South Africa in its struggle against apartheid. I think I mentioned Nigeria's example because uh, I can tell you that many, many African countries really contributed uh, heavily to the liberation of uh, the entire southern Africa. And this is what they love about the host nation. I love everything about South Africa. <laughs> I love the weather, the music, the food. Um, I've been here for a very long time, so most, almost all my friends are, um, are South Africans. Um, I think even though I'm a Ghanaian, this is home. What an inspirational, motivational time it has been here. Indeed, this has been a celebration of unity, diversity and culture. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Innocent Samosa, Channel Television News. Guinea's mangrove forests are a vital sanctuary for a variety of endangered species, from the colobus monkey to the African manatee. But the habitats of these animals are being further threatened by illegal logging. Anika Hammerschlag reports from Debreka, Guinea. Beneath Guinea's dense canopy of mangroves, an illicit industry is thriving. Loggers, such as Mamadou Jallo, are illegally chopping upwards of 40 trees per day. It is a dangerous job that is causing great harm to the mangroves. I do it because I have no other means of income. That's why I give myself to this work, even though it is very hard and threatens the ecosystem. Guinea was once home to a 300-kilometer stretch of pristine mangrove forest. But now, large swaths lay barren. Rapid urbanization of the country's capital, Conakry, has increased pressure on Guinea's natural resources. And chronic political instability has created a safe haven for illegal loggers. Mangroves filter pollutants from the water, protect coastlines from storm surges, and sink massive amounts of carbon, a critical role in the fight against climate change. They also provide essential habitat for wildlife, such as monkeys, migratory birds, and the elusive African manatee, of which there are only about 10,000 left. The fish feeds on manatee feces, so if we do not protect the manatees, tomorrow or after tomorrow, will we not have difficulties catching fish? Mangrove wood is used mainly for construction, charcoal production, and smoking fish. The forests are also slashed to make room for rice paddies. Guinea outlawed mangrove logging decades ago. Legislators have since revised the laws to further protection, yet logging continues out in the open. Enforcement has been difficult, says Karim Samoura, General Secretary of Guinea's Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development. It's unfortunate to say, but in Guinea, we are often in a situation where progress is made on a project and concrete steps are made, but when the project ends, there are few who try to move things forward. In the end, the projects aren't taken up properly by new managers, which often means there are breakdowns. Samora says he plans to relaunch surveillance of the mangroves and to diversify income-generating activities of nearby communities. Meanwhile, experts say Guinea's mangroves and the animals that live within will continue to pay the price. Annika Hammerschlag for VOA News, Dubraka, Guinea. Well, and that's our show for today. You can find all the continent's top news and world news online at voaafrica.com. Check it out. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Channel's television has our last word. We look forward to bringing you another show next week. Do remember, channelstv.com is your source for news and other programming. I am Vukola Koka. Thank you for watching and goodbye.